Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of Sports Insight with your host Alamdar Khan. And yes, as you know, we give you sports information from all across the globe. You guys can surely reach out to us on our social media handle, which is at the rate of Indus News Sports. That works both for Twitter and for Instagram. But anyways, we'll go to the headlines first. And yes, from the world of Olympic basketball, Slovenia rolled past Argentina 118-100 in their debut match, while Japan loses to Spain by 77-88 in the first group stage game. And yes, from the world of Olympic tennis, talking about Naomi Osaka being eliminated from to Tokyo Olympics tennis tournament after losing against Czech Republic's Markata. And it's going to be interesting to see that while Djokovic actually raced into the third round of Tokyo Olympics following a victory over Germany's Leonard Struff. And yes, talking about Olympic golf, John Ram and Bryson DeChambeau are out of the Tokyo Olympics after coronavirus positive tests. And yes, from the world of cricket, Shahid Afridi is all set to play in Everest Premier League in Kathmandu, Nepal. And yes, those were the headlines and talking more about the interesting happenings with regards to Olympic Olympics, definitely we talk about Olympics basketball for now and to discuss Olympic basketball and the in-depth analysis of how truly Slovenia actually managed to win past Argentina 118 to 100 at the Olympic debut. But to discuss the in-depth analysis, we have with us Eric all the way from the US. Eric, welcome to the show. Hi, actually from Toronto, but how are you guys doing? We're absolutely fine. Well, thank you for joining us, Eric. So, interesting turn of events with regards to basketball. And surely we would want your input because now I'm going to talk about Slovenia's debut match against Argentina, scoring 118 to 100. And Luka Doncic actually grabbed 31 points for Slovenia. So, I surely want to have your intake with regards to how this entire match went in the positive side for Slovenia. Well, I think it's all Luka Doncic all the time. Um, he was a remarkable. He scored 48, 31 points in the first half, really put it away. Um, his ability to kind of control the game right. without, you know, he basically played the way he plays in the NBA. He scored and he was unstoppable in every single facet. You know, he had his three-pointer cooking as well. He went six for 14. But I think the way he's able to make the team around him, no matter who it is, um, you know, like kind of rise to the occasion, I think is, is sort of... The trademark of how good he is, you know, and uh, and to put up 48 points in a uh, in the opening round in his Olympic debut, I mean, uh, it's just incredible, and he's a really phenomenal athlete, and he kind of showed that um, he may be the best player in this tournament, and that might be enough for Slovenia to. Uh, Right. And the interesting part is obviously as it's their debut. So I think they have a long way to go. If you look at all the groups, I think in Group C right now, they just play one game and won that one. So And, you know, Spain also won the single game. So they both actually have 1-1 one, one points each. And talking about Spain, we talk about how Japan lost to Spain. Uh, and obviously, Japan managed to score only 77, whereas Spain scored 88 points. So I think in Group C right now, um, Japan is and Argentina are like number th third and number fourth. So how was the match between Spain and Japan as well? Well, I think it was a great start for Spain. You know, um, they're the number two team uh, ranked in FIBA coming into this. Everyone's kind of expecting uh, USA Spain final the third time in four Olympics that they would meet. Uh, it's just a good start. You know, like the thing with Spain too in terms of cohesion, their their main stars are Marcus Sol and Ricky Rubio, who are kind of uh, you know, serviceable, uh, good NBA players, but on Team Spain, they are great hubs, and they have just a, a roster of, of players that are that have NBA experience. Um, you know, Paul Gasol is there, uh, Sergio Rodriguez uh, was there, um, Victor Claver. You know, they have they have guys that are able to uh, to step in. But I think their their biggest factor or their biggest success is that they've been together in this program for so long. And I think that that's why there's such a powerhouse to kind of contend. They don't have a dominant score. You know, in their game against uh, Japan, they had nine, uh, six guys that scored nine points or more. So they're able to spread it around and, and they do have a roster that can contend. Right. And I think Japan is actually going to be under a lot of pressure because the next team that they're going to face is going to be Slovenia. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, Japan is... So this is where it can get tricky because the host country, they can always throw uh, throw teams for a loop in these sorts of events, you know. I, I think that the disadvantage for Japan is that there are no fans um, watching these games. So that home court advantage is kind of gone. But um, in, in these short tournaments, every game matters. So uh, it's important for Slovenia because Argentina and Spain are, are two of the top four teams ranked in FIBA. Um, so they, you imagine that they're going to be there. I just think in this in this group, um, it's so strong that I think three teams are going to come out of it and into the uh, into the elimination bracket. Right, it's surely going to be interesting. But don't you think Japan, obviously hosting the event itself, we talk whenever we talk about Olympics right now, it's obviously Tokyo Olympics. So how do you see Japan playing its part as a team? Because don't you think they would be having and they should have had the home ground edge even against Spain to begin with. Yeah, no, I, I, I wish, I would have loved to see how they, how they would have played with their, with their crowd and their, uh, their fans behind them. It's really difficult that they haven't. Uh, they still played, I think it's a, it was a tough matchup for them because just the experience that Spain showed, um, I mean, they kind of were able to take it into, you know, the game was tied at 26, and then they went on a 19-0 run. Spain did 22-2 uh, to to close out the half, and that was kind of it. So... I think Japan has some good players. I mean, obviously, Rui Hachimura is uh, is their star. Uh, Yuta Watanabe from the Raptors is also there, and they're going to try to compete. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they do against Slovenia. Uh, I feel like they should be able to put up a put up a, a good fight, and we'll just see how they handle Luka Doncic. Um, you know, Argentina did all they could; they just couldn't stop him. I mean, I don't think anybody was stopping Luka that night. So, it really, if he's on, um, I don't really know if there's an answer for Japan. Right, and looking at the tables, if you look into that, obviously I think it surely is a tough group. This is the Group C that we're discussing. But yet again, even if we talk about Group A and Group B, if we go in directly into Group B, we talk about Australia. I think Australia is right now one of the most solid teams themselves. So, and not only that, I think it's going to be interesting to see because Nigeria is also in Group B. And if you remember, the pre-matches that actually took place in Vegas and U.S. lost against Nigeria. So U.S. is in a very tricky situation right now. If you remember them losing the first match to begin with, how do you see them making their comeback as well? You know, that is going to be a crucial question because all M NBA stars, the main ones, are in it. I mean, I think all eyes are on the U.S. team. They, they entered the tournament um, struggling. They lost you know, to Nigeria and to Australia before they got, got to Tokyo. And they really struggled against France in in terms of for a team that's built as being an offensive juggernaut and sort of the best offensive players at this tournament, probably outside of Luka Doncic, they couldn't make a shot. So um, I think for them, there's, there's going to be a little bit of pressure, but I think that I think that the matchup with Iran uh, tomorrow is actually going to be a, a good one for them um, to get back into this, to kind of feel good. It's a tough one to go into when you're not when you're not playing well or you're kind of start, starting to gel together to take on a team like France who's been together, who's got a program and a system in place. So um, we'll see how they respond to this one because um, I think if uh, another loss, and I think they're out probably. Right. But do you think uh, in terms of the team itself, uh, don't you think Milwaukee Bucks should have directly been the whole team coming out there to play against you know, and representing the Olympics? <laughs> Well, they've always talked about that, about uh, an NBA team actually going and representing uh, at the Olympics. Uh, it would be really tough. I mean, I think it would be be interesting to see, but then we wouldn't see Giannis, right? Giannis would end up having to play for Greece, so he'd be out of that lineup. So um, I, I think I would say that I think it was really remarkable to see uh, Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday make it and actually play. And Drew Holiday played serious minutes against France. He played a ton, and he was one of their best players. So... Kudos to him for turning around from winning a championship to getting on a flight um, and, and basically turning it over in 24 hours. It's pretty remarkable. Unfortunately, they didn't uh, have enough to, uh, to pull out a win. Right. And in talking about the team itself, I still think <clears throat> not, not only about the firepower, I think it's about the gelling. <clears throat> Once the gelling is done, I think things would probably fall into a better shape for it, the United States. But it's going to be super interesting if we talk about Iran, if, if I'm not wrong. <clears throat> Well, yeah, it will be. I, I think one of the things with watching the United States play, it, there's still 
There is. It's just a cohesion thing. There are a lot of plays and a lot of sets where uh, you would see a couple of players run into the same open spaces. Um, I think it's one of those things we've talked about how Spain, kind of everybody knows their role. Um, I was talking about this with some friends is that watching the United States play, these guys, minus maybe Drew Holiday and Draymond Green, most of these guys have been the, the one option, A, on their teams. And now they're asking them to play certain roles as you're standing in the corner or you're spotting up over here or you're going to be the cutting guy that the ball isn't going to be in your hands all the time. So it's it's a different adjustment for them. And I think they'll be able to pick it up in time. They're just too talented to not do it. But, uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see how they do against Iran. I, I, I would be surprised if it wasn't a blowout victory. Well, let's be hope for the best because it's going to be Iran and them getting to this point is also interesting. But anyways, once again, Eric, thank you so very much for being a part of the show and discussing the in-depth analysis of the Olympic basketballs. Not to forget that the interesting match that is going to happen tomorrow is going to be the U.S. versus Iran. That is one question mark because the U.S. actually lost their first match and everyone has their eyebrows up and they're like, what truly went wrong? But anyways, guys, what we'll do is we'll take a quick break. Once we get back from the break, there is more coming up from the world of sports. See you guys after the break. Welcome back from the break. And yes, before the break, we were discussing the world of basketball in Olympics, how interesting it is going and further, we'll surely be discussing more as it progresses ahead. But anyways, we we'll also want to talk about what's more happening in the world of tennis. Yes, we're talking about Olympic tennis and big names like Naomi Osaka to begin with has been eliminated. But to discuss the in-depth analysis on how she managed to lose against Marquetta from Czech Republic. We have with us Amy all the way from the US. Amy, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Great. So Amy, we'll start off with obviously Naomi Osaka is a big name, a big legend out there. The thing is, she has already been, already been going through her ups and downs. But her losing against the Czech is surely another question mark. So how do you see this match and this loss for her? It's complicated, isn't it? Because she had taken that extended break for her her mental health, which she obviously needed and, and we're very supportive of that. But the downside of that is that she didn't play competitive matches for a long time, many, many weeks. And so when you're out of that competition mode um, and, and then you experience a lot of pressure, which she obviously felt representing her country in her home country at the Olympics, then you're just not match ready. And I think that showed. Now, Von Drusova is a fantastic player and she may go on to medal at these Olympics. But um, Naomi just wasn't up for it and she committed, I think, 30 uh, errors Right. So um, over 30. So um, it just was a, a kind of a sloppy match for her. Well, we surely look forward to that. But Amy, the, the strange part about the world lately, if you've noticed, is even in terms of sports, uh, we've seen a lot of bullying lately. We, if you talk about any player, if you talk about your 2020, how people started having those racial comments against you know, the last three footballers who could not score for England. Uh, it started from there and I think slowly and gradually the social media element has actually been creating even if we talk about Lewis Hamilton from F1 he won the title but obviously there were still those racial remarks how can an individual specifically an athlete do I mean, if you talk about Osaka she's a, a legend she's a living legend but as you said that you know people can give her the support that she needs but to an extent but to be honest how the trajectory is going in terms of people's behavior to humans, to all the athletes out there, uh, it's really alarming to see that you know all the bully and everything is happening through these social mediums. I wish I had the answer. It is so frustrating. I don't know. I don't know if, if this is just the way we are or if social media is doing this to us, but and it and it's just showing up in a very public way. But we've got to discuss it, talk about it, start listening to each other more, have more empathy, start understanding each other more. Right. And um, I, I think Osaka, you know, maybe needs to um, 
take a break from social media because she's getting into flame wars with with public figures on social media. I don't think it's doing good for her mental health. Um, but on the other side of it, you know, we as human beings have got to start being more kind to each other. Absolutely. Let's hope the message goes a long way. Anyways, we we'll surely want to talk about the next interesting match. We are talking about the king right here. We talk about Djokovic, you know, how he managed to get into the Wimbledon final and got hold of where he's supposed to be. But right now, he is ready climbing up the stairs to get another gold. How do you see him taking his journey further in the game of tennis and representing obviously not only himself but you know I think his title which he definitely has his eyes on. He's really playing for country isn't he? I mean he has so much to play for right now and you can tell how important it is to him despite right. all the individual accomplishments that he's had. He's playing for Serbia. Right. And, you know, unlike um, Osaka, he seems to be handling the pressure so calmly. And, right. and um, there have been times when he's had, you know, dust ups and, and that kind of thing. He just seems so cool and chilled out and calm right now. And he is sailing through this tournament. Now, on the bottom half of the draw, you've got Tsitsipas from Greece playing well, right. and you've got Danil Medvedev playing well. Right. So um, I think in the semifinals and, and, um, and the finals, he will have some tough tests. Right. Talking about tough tests, I surely had my eyes on Medvedev and Tsitsipas back then in Wimbledon. But their journey came up to a halt. But talking about the Serbian himself, if you talk about Djokovic, I was going through one of his interviews and he very calmly said that, you know, I started hearing the chanting. I'm, I'm talking about this one particular match with Roger Federer, if you remember the one iconic match. When, when, and he said that I just made up my mind that people are, you know, uh, raising voice and being happy and saying my name, even though people were saying Federer's name. And he said, I just made up my mind. So I think there's a lot of brain game in terms of how you can actually decide your own fate. And right now, I think the biggest example is Djokovic. Isn't that a great point that you just brought up? I mean, I think we all could take a page from that when, when we are facing adversity, um, just to turn it and flip it and, and pretend that the adversity is something that we're hearing in our favor. And um, that's what he was talking about when he faced Roger Federer at Wimbledon. And the crowd was really cheering for, for Federer. And Federer had those two match points. Right. And Djokovic fended that off and was able to win the match. And uh, I also read an interview where a lot of the Olympic athletes from other sports were approaching him at these Olympic Games and asking, asking him for advice on mental toughness. So it's a great point. Well, uh, I'm sure and I hope that, you know, all all the athletes out there learn some wisdom from him. So anyways, we'd also want to talk about, obviously, Medvedev's progress. And he also has that potential of taking the journey further. His victory, obviously, against Sumit is, is something to be talked about. And I think Sumit is the only person, if you remember, he has this history that, he you know, he managed to uh, win against Roger Federer back in 2019. Uh, if you talk about the US Open. But right now, obviously, I think Medvedev has that edge right now, not only him, him, but I think in the long run, it may be some serious fireworks when we talk about the semifinals or the finals of the Olympic tennis. Sumit Nagal is a tough out. He's very tough to beat. He has a little bit of a different game style. Um, it is, he's a grinder. It's uh, hard to get a victory against him. And Medvedev did well to get through that match. Uh, Medvedev is uh, a great character with um, a game style that is able to redirect a lot of pace. Right. So I think Medvedev is definitely one to watch. He's the number two seed in this tournament. So that means he wouldn't uh, meet Djokovic until the finals. So he's definitely one to keep an eye on. Right. This is surely going to be interesting. Uh, but in terms of the overall perspective of the Olympics tennis, if you talk about Medvedev himself, if you look back into performance, because I think uh, in terms of the courts, things are different. If you talk about Wimbledon, things probably did not shape up well back then. 
so do you think that has any impact because now making and you know coming up strongly would surely leave a very positive impact on his motivation to you know reach the finals or maybe get the gold I've never experienced, you know, playing on a tennis tour. So it's hard to say what their mentality is at the Olympics versus something like Wimbledon. But you've got to believe that tennis is such an individual sport that when you're playing for yourself in a Grand Slam, it's one mentality. And then when you're playing for country, it takes on a different level and, and you just have a different feel to everything you do. Perhaps you feel more pressure, but on on the other side, perhaps you feel more supported um, by your other team members that are there and you feel that you are playing for something higher than just yourself. So I, it'll be interesting to see how Medvedev handles that. And um, I, I think at my sense is that he'll play a little bit better than he did at, at Wimbledon. Right. And what's your take on if you talk about Sitsi Pass as well? I think he also won superstar but he just needs to come right now out of out there to prove his metal because i totally compare compare all of them uh, when i look back into wimbledon so how do you see him further making progress as to where he should be right now yeah i remember that Pass went out very early at wimbledon so yeah. um he was coming off back it up to the French Open and it was a tight turnaround, that two week turnaround where he had made the finals and lost to Djokovic in five sets. Then he comes and loses the first round at Wimbledon. Right. Um, I, I really didn't think much of it because he was probably exhausted and emotionally overwhelmed. Now he's had a nice long break going into the Olympics. And you're right, he is a superstar. He's got the all court game. He's got the skills to take sets off of Djokovic. And now he's playing for his beloved Greece. So I also see him as a contender to medal in this Olympics. Well, we'll surely look forward and we wish all these superstars the best. Thank you so much, Amy, for being a part of the show and discussing the world of Olympic tennis with us. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. You too. So that was A and yes, she gave us all the in-depth analysis with regards to how tennis is progressing in the world of Olympics. Surely with time things will unfold and as soon as they do, we'll surely bring you all the updates. But anyways, a quick update with regards to Olympic golf. All right, once again, COVID-19 strikes. Yes, we're talking about John Ram and Bryson DeChambeau out of Olympic golf. Why? Because of the COVID-19 situation. And if you look back, John Ram actually have been through a COVID-19 situation, a COVID-19 positive test. And same goes for DeChambeau. The point is, he, I remember, at the memorial had this, uh, John Ram had this, and, you know, he was leading the entire tournament, but he was asked to bye-bye. So that's exactly why he could not get that, but he still never gave up hope. So I think the Olympic overall tournament, the only question mark that is still out there is how to handle these coronavirus situations. And I think that is the most alarming thing things when we talk about Olympics but yet again they both are out and I think they're like the two main superstars of uh, the Olympic golf however Patrick Reed is undergoing a requisited testing for the uh, uh, coronavirus situation I think he Reed is the only two-time Olympian for the men's champion so there are a few updates with regards to how COVID-19 is trying to be under control or how the authorities are trying to keep a check not only on the players but obviously the spectators because slowly and gradually we are seeing a few spectators but anyways let's hope the virus still is remains under control because the whole thing about the virus is that the delta variant out is really really alarming anyways this was from the world of olympics overall i'll quickly jump over to the world of cricket all right in, the, in terms of the world of cricket shahid afridi is all set to play every premier league in nepal and he is the former captain and not to tell you guys more interestingly he's he actually set to play for Kathmandu kings 11 but remember he could not play psl for the fact in terms of his back injury but right now i think he's finally at a point where he can let's hope and wish him the very best in terms of his performance and let's hope it comes out good for him anyways this was pretty much it if you want to reach out to us you can on our social media handle which is at the rate of indus news sports till then take good care of yourselves and bye bye